All right. Let's see how this goes. Okay. Um, I think we are live. All right, everybody, welcome to the uh, weekly Strength Club podcast and Q&A. It is just me today. Um, we'll talk more about why later, uh, but we'll go over the topics. Um, we're going to talk about uh, valgus knees, uh, overextended um, lumbar spines, other things in movement that people really like to correct or jump on immediately, which we may not need to as much as we think. Um, this is Strength Club. It's a weekly show um, where myself, Alex Kosari, and normally Chase Lindley, or Mick Solomons too. Um, we work for Starting Strength. We'll go over topics that are pertinent to that, um, lifting, programming, injury, pain, all that stuff, sport management. Um, and yeah, uh, we have a pretty good amount of content. Um, so dig through the channel, see what you like. Um, here are our socials. Chase is at Chase Lindley. He's the four or five press guy. Um, I do online coaching up. You found here, uh, we got a bunch of videos in. we got six or seven from last time that we still have to go through. Um, and if you want to get more videos on the show from the starting strength app, that's going to be at support at strength.club. Okay. Um, all right. So the first thing we're going to talk about is just going to say just like itinerary for the day. Um, we're going to talk about, um, valgus knees. We're going to talk about lumbar overextension and when to correct movement. Um, Chase and Alex training updates, which is now just going to be me. Um, apparently what happened to Chase, he's having some problems managing his, uh, uh, I think he's type one diabetic, whatever the genetic type is that you have from your kid. I'm forgetting that right now. Um, and then we're going to go over, uh, form checks that we have from last week. Um, so I guess we'll dig right into the first topic. Uh, this may end up being a short one, so we'll see. Um, the valgus varus relationship with knees, otherwise known as the knee cave pattern in a squat. Um, we're going to talk about identifying the source of it, um, talking about the adductors, that inner thigh groin muscle group as hip extensors, what those are doing, um, and then how those adductors tend to pull the knees in. And we'll have some videos, examples of that, which would be nice. Um, and then to start, we'll put it like this so we can see what we're talking about. Um, this on the left, we're just going to consider to be anatomically normal. Um, this is going to be like the knees slightly inside or under the hip joint. Um, varus knees, they're going to be aimed outside. Uh, they're going to be significantly farther out. Let's say like notably farther out. Um, and then like the clinical version of valgus knees being like knock knees, like someone who has like rickets or something or other sort of like genetic um condition where we're uh they're just designed that way it's pretty rare to see that nowadays you, you don't really see that going on too often um uh, in the sport world people are talking about a very slight version of this about knock knees or valgus knees on the right um, we'll get some video examples of this so we can see it in movement Go over here Okay, hopefully you guys can see this. This is Ben Pollock. Um, he is squatting 738 at 181 pounds. I'm gonna get to his unrack. And then what we wanna watch basically, just look at his knee wraps. They're gonna shoot in towards each other as he starts to come up on the ascent. So he's gonna come down and pause it here. Um, ben Pollock has a relatively shorter torso, longer legs. So if you look at it, it looks like his middle section has disappeared. He is really leaned over right now and that's totally okay. Um, and then when he comes up, watch his knees, the knees come in together, okay? Is this bad? We'll talk more about that later. And then we'll go through this more time just so we can see a more firm example of this. He's unracking, guy's pretty sick quads. He's now bodybuilding. This is 2016 and he already looks like a bodybuilder. It's 2022 now. He looks pretty, pretty gnarly now. It's, it's amazing. Um, but that's an example of valgus knees or the knee cave pattern on the squat. Um, and then we'll watch Jessica Butner or Butner. I'm not entirely sure how to say this. Her descent speed is much faster. The varus in there or the valgus in the knees is also much more noticeable. So we'll try and pause this one at the bottom. This is her bottom position. Um, it's really deep. She's very leaned over. Uh, whenever we use the Q set, like drop your chest down. So you guys can see me open it like this. Whenever you, we use the Q set, put your chest down between your knees. Look at her. You see how her chest is literally down in between her knees. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about leaning over, especially for people with short torsos. Okay. And then we'll watch how when she stands up, her knees are nice to the outside. Oop. That's about as in as they get. We'll try and pause it on the most in. Right there. That's about as in words as they get. So this is as valgus or as caved in as the knees get. Okay. She reacts that. Both of these squats were, I'm sure they were terribly hard, but they weren't like the end of the world for them. You know, I think they both went on to set significantly uh, heavier PRs past that point. Um, 
So identifying the source of this, uh, there's kind of a bad valgus, which we'll talk about, and then kind of a good or expected one. Um, the bad one can often come from a stance issue. Like if the stance is just dramatically too wide and the person has too shallow of a toe angle, their knees are already going to be pointed in and they'll kind of just pull in more as they're squatting. It tends to be really uncomfortable. Um, you'll see it who are on people who are relatively new with squatting overall. Um, generally, what they'll find is they think they need to take a really wide stance for like the sake of balance or something to that effect, um, and that they don't really know how to shove their knees out to the side. Um, generally speaking, if the stance is too wide, you'll see some function of this, but we want to pull the stance in for many reasons outside of just the valgus knees. Um, it could be a toe angle thing too. So even if they have the right toe or the the right stance width, but their toes are pointed even a little bit in, sometimes you see that, or just straight ahead. Um, the Doctors, whenever they start doing their thing, the knees will shoot in. Um, it could be a balance point issue as well. Uh, one of the major patterns that I've been seeing uh, on the app whenever people send their form checks in there, if we do see kind of a knee cave or a valgus knee pattern, is they're basically they'll, they'll send their hips backwards a little bit too far, and then they need to get their knees forward again as they're coming out of the hole. And then what happens is the knees collapse inwards as they're going forward. Um, so just making sure, again, balance is over the middle of the foot. The stance is correct. All of these things are what we can consider setup errors for the most part. Um, like fixing the stance, fixing the toe angle, making sure you know where to drive out of the bottom. Um, they're not, I wouldn't say, really true movement errors for most people. Uh, you will see some people who just don't have any real active control of their knees at all. Those are times when you really need to cue, cue knees out. You need to make sure they're not letting them collapse at all. Um, now, I guess we should talk about the adductors as hip extensors. Um, so coming out of the bottom of the squat, that's hip extension and knee extension under load. Um, the hip extensors, normally people think about them as like the hamstrings in the case of like a deadlift pattern, um, the glutes. Um, these are our big hip extensors. The adductors are also doing that. They tie in on the back of your pelvis, kind of near where your sit bones are. Um, yeah, Darmada, feel free to ask questions. I'm just going through this basically kind of as a lecture. You pop in whenever you want to pop in. Um, but yeah, so the adductors are going to cross the hip. At the bottom of the squat, they're going to be relatively long, right? And then as they're very long, they want to contract in. That's the bounce. That's kind of the pop out of the bottom that we're feeling. Um, and then as they get shorter, they will also pull the knees in. Um, so what we're seeing is that uh, on, on Ben and Jessica, those two videos I was playing before, they squatted down to the bottom. They have very long femurs. Their uh, adductors got as long as they could. They had that big stretch reflex. They bounced out of the bottom. And then as the adductors are doing their work, they will pull the knees in towards each other. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's very rare to see on people who have really short femurs. So if you're dealing with someone who has like a relatively long torso, really short femurs, um, a knee cave or a, a valgus knee pattern, it's not super common. You don't, you don't really see it that much. Um, you will see it more often on people who have shorter torsos and longer femurs. Um, those people tend to be good deadlifters for uh, similar mechanical reasons as well. Um, a lot of people think that if the knees cave in at all, the glutes have failed or they're not doing as much work as they could. Um, the glutes are really good hip extensors in all of these positions. Okay, So even if the knees are caving in, the glutes are still able to do their job. Um, if we have have a super wide position with our knees and then we don't allow the adductors to work at kind of like a let's say a more preferable length tension relationship they're not contributing as much as they could otherwise right um, so it's like we're not aiming to limit range of motion we're aiming to maximize training over as many muscles as we can um, so we want to pick this moderate stance train the adductors a good bit, use them as hip extensors, uh, and it's 100% okay if the knees come in a little bit. Um, we don't want it to be completely uncontrolled, but what you're gonna see is like the knees will pop in a little bit coming out of the bottom, and then they'll come out on the way back up. Um, now, if some people have just kind of like this medially uh, tilted foot, they'll, it'll almost look like their ankles have kind of fallen and collapsed in towards the midline of their body. Um, sometimes an orthotic to kind of pick their uh, foot up that way. If this is like the outside of their foot, this is the inside. Um, that seems to really help. Um, but otherwise, there's not too, too much to do about it. Um, yeah, the adductors pulling the knees in, um, it's honestly just kind of a fact of life. I think a lot of novice coaches will really focus on this in their training. And a lot of people who think it's like, okay, I need to have, keep the knees out is like my number one priority. Um, oftentimes in communication, that's not our number one priority. Um, our number one priority is how is the movement looking really from like a hip drive perspective, from a balance point perspective. If you are driving the hips up and you were satisfying the criteria of the barbell being over the middle of the foot, the knees coming in a little bit is totally fine. Um, it's difficult 
to keep the bar over the middle of your foot and drive your hips up if the knees collapse in wildly, right? So if the knees collapse in wildly, that can cause other issues. And if it's causing other issues, then that's the time when we want to correct the movement. But if it's like relatively moderate, that's totally fine to deal with. Okay, um, we'll actually do some form checks now. And we'll do form checks. And then after that, we'll pop in because I had a few squats that I wanted to go through. To, and if you guys have some questions, we got a few people hanging around. Um, pop off in the chat, ask a question. I know Dermata said he was going to and then did not. All right, so this is, what's this gentleman's name? John Larson. He is squatting barefoot, no socks in a public gym. He's a very brave man. If you get good at watching uh, videos online, if you do a lot of online consulting for um, for things like this, you'll be able to see even from this angle the knee shooting into the side. Um, if you guys can see this from your end, uh, it's it's going to look like the knees are kind of collapsing in towards each other. Um, and again, it's not really the it's not the major thing that we need to correct here. First things first, at least wear socks. I think I think the gym staff would want you to wear socks. Stance to me looks a little bit too narrow, if anything. Um, and then the big thing is that he's sliding forward of midfoot almost the entire time. A lot of times this means there's just kind of an uncontrolled descent or the person's attempting to keep their chest angle too vertical. We'll figure out more on later reps. Okay, um, so it's certainly the head position and then how vertical he's trying to be. He's keeping his face basically pointed straight ahead the whole time, and he's keeping his chest nice and upright. Um, this would be good on something like a front squat or like a really high, high bar squat. It's not the greatest thing in a low bar squat, because what's happening is that because he's trying to keep his chest so vertical, his knees have to go forward. And when his knees are going forward, his whole balance point is shifting forward of midfoot. Um, what we want is for him to send his hips backwards as he's leaning over a little bit more. Um, so if we think back to those videos we saw earlier of Ben and Jessica, remember how their pecs were literally right up against their knees. That's really kind of a position that uh, we're aiming for here. Yeah, so if we have to triage movement and then figure out what to do, we want to tackle the setup errors first. So a setup error being like, aim your face down the entire time, widen your stance up about an inch on each side. Um, once we've to put the gaze down and widen up the stance, then we can work on leaning over more and sending your butt back behind you. Um, yeah, the primary cues of sitting back behind you, sending your hips back, sending your butt back, putting your chest down, all of those things would be good for John. We got a question for Dharmada. Um, he said, I've been doing SS for about a month and a half now, and I've been seeing good results, which is good, but I've been noticing lower back pain and strain throughout the day, and particularly after a workout. Um, how old are you? Are you gaining weight? How much weight are you putting on the bar each time? Um, go look up. Here we go. Um, he said, I've also been lending a belt or using a belt when doing a list and it has helped reduce strain and pain. Um, okay. Yeah, for sure. That's, that's not an entirely, uh, atypical experience. Um, Mark Rupito has a really good article, uh, called the first three questions. And it's going to talk to you about how much you're sleeping, how much you're eating, what your recovery resources are going to be like how long you're resting in between sets, and then what weight jumps you're taking, right? Because if you were taking 10 pound jumps for the first three workouts, and you've, let's say, have continued taking 10 pound jumps a month and a half in, you're probably just exceeding your body's tolerance um, to squat while also, or squat or deadlift while also being pain-free for right now. Um, so slower jumps, slowing that whole process down would probably be beneficial. Um, let's say, yeah, is it expected or to be normal? It's not necessarily expected, but it is, it's it's not like, it's, it's not entirely atypical Dharmana. Um, I would make sure that you're having ample recovery resources. I make sure you're not taking overly aggressive jumps. And then after that, I would check out the email in like the show notes or earlier on in the, in the, in the presentation and then send some videos in. Cause it's very possible that your form is just very off of what we're going for. You know, um, you're having a lot of spinal movement under load and it's irritating for you. Um, and those are things that need to be corrected. Uh, so like, you know, it, hopefully you've had access to a coach earlier on in this process. Um, but you know, if you're squatting deadlift or kind of all over the place, it could be, it could be causing, uh, some irritation for you. So he's 19 sleeping good 1.5 kilo jumps at a time. Um, he's the end of the Gomad diet. Interesting. 
how much weight have you gained so far, Dramat, in the first month and a half? Um, yeah, I would say the first thing here is just to send in videos. Absolutely send in videos for us. Um, if you have already, let us know what your name is, and I'll, I'll try to get to him today. Um, but uh, the, the joking thing we say to everybody is like, we can't see your squat and deadlift from here. It's kind of because we can't, you know. Um, so you could be doing some very silly things that we're entirely unaware of. All right, we'll go to the next one. You've gained around 5 kg. That's that's pretty solid. Kind of keep expecting that rate of gain. Um, next video we have here is from Claire Ann. Get this up on the screen. Here we go. Another, oh, she's in socks this time. Nobody has squatting shoes this episode. Okay. I think these are 45s too. So this would be a pretty cool 135 squat. Oh, this is a great uh, time for me to pivot into lumbar overextension. Um, okay, great. Uh, yeah, so first things first here, I would say get some squatting shoes. So she has like some standard running shoes there. Um, she has some standard running shoes in front of her. It's better to squat barefoot than in those running shoes, uh, personally. Um, the grip is okay. The bar is a little bit high. She's a little bit forward. Um, the big thing here is you're going to want to think about having tight abs, squeezing your abs, clenching your tummy down, like physically poke your lifter in the belly button and say like, tighten this up. Um, what's happening is that we're seeing a lot of movement around the spine, especially the, the lower back, but she's not really leaning over that much. She's not leaning over enough to get down to a proper a proper depth or at least comfortably. Um, I would cue this lifter to lean over immediately, lean over more, get your chest down in between uh, your knees, sending your butt back a little bit more. Um, and that'll certainly be productive. Yeah, if you guys can see this on the ascent particularly, I want you to watch basically the spot right here on her lower back. You can see it when they have a loose shirt too. That's really helpful. So she's gonna go down and then what we're gonna see is like a bunch of wrinkles forming right here in the bottom of the shirt. So that lifter is focused almost entirely on extension rather than driving the hips up and keeping a more neutral back position like we want. Um, and then we'll talk more about that in the next lecture or next part of the slides. Um, but overall, these are these are pretty decent squats to start. I would say get a belt, work on bracing your abs, tuck into like a more normal or neutral lower back position rather than focusing on extension. Um, lean over, drive your hips up. Dale. I haven't seen Dale in a while. He said, I've binged dirty bulk 16 pounds in a month as intermediate training going from 192 to 208 tips to get back on track. Hmm. Five, seven, 29 years old. That's an interesting one, Dale. Are you saying that you are trying to still bulk more or are you trying to now lose weight? What is getting back on track for you? How's it going, Johnny G? Um, yeah, Dale, I'm not sure which directions you're taking that, but 16 pounds in a month, that's not going to be all muscle mass, even, even a little bit. I think the, that's, that's very fast for, for a time period of month. That may be almost entirely all fat. You kind of want to spread that timeline out a little bit more. Um, we're probably going to come back to Claire's video here a little bit later on. Let's see if we have any more squats that we want to check out. See if we can see any more knee position stuff going on. Um, we have one from MJ here, MJDC, longtime friend of the show. Okay, Dale. Yeah, you want to lose the fat? That's very understandable. Um, slow calorie deficit, starting in activity that you don't really notice. So, like, don't start going on five mile runs every day, um, but start going on some more little walks here and there. Add in two or three 10 minute walks a day. Um, and then do some honest self accounting as to where your calories are coming from. Um, there's so many things on the substitution market now for dieting foods that you can probably eat pretty samey foods to what you're used to eating without actually having to compromise too much. Um, like if you're used to eating candy, you can probably just eat a Quest bar that tastes like candy instead, so instead of a Snickers bar. If you're used to eating chips, you can probably find some protein chips or some protein popcorn. If you're used to eating pizza, you can probably find those Quest protein pizzas. Um, same thing with like iced tea and like sugary soda, full sugar soda, switch to diet. Um, the first thing that I do for everybody's diet consulting is figure out what they're eating now in terms of accounting, um, and then just replacing whatever we can replace really conveniently. Um, so it's like, I don't want to have to modify habits. I don't want to have to modify totals that you're eating. None of that stuff. If I don't necessarily have to, we just go substitutions first and then start tackling the other things later. Once we kind of have some momentum going. 
Yeah, and also avoid avoid gaining 16 pounds in a month, dog. That's pretty rough. Um, so this is MJDC's squat here. I saw some of this. I think he goes for a double before. Oh, you're in the UK, Dale. Yeah, man. That's that's totally understandable. Um, I have two lifters from the UK, um, Tidor and another guy named Andrew. Um, they're both very solid, like the UK guys. I don't think we're going to see much uh, problems with the knee position here. I do think that MJ is going to raise his head and be a little bit too chesty on this rep. Yeah, he also gets forward a midfoot. Okay. Yeah, this is hard for people with um, with with longer torsos and get kind of like larger stomachy build. Um, so MJ, in terms of priorities here, I would focus again, like we were talking about earlier, getting your pecs down in between your knees, sending your butt back and behind you. Don't think forward. Don't think vertical. Don't think upright really at all if you're using those cues. And almost actually on this rep, on his first rep, he rocks forward a little bit, starts forward of midfoot, and then initiates the rep when his balance isn't even set. Um, I would take some more time at the top, solidify your balance point, and then focus on sending your butt backwards to start the rep. Um, the hard ascent that we're seeing on rep two, that's from you driving your chest up and not your hips up. Um, so if you drive your hips up reliably, that is not going to be an issue. You want to think about driving the back of your belt, your tailbone, the, the, uh, the tag in the back of your pants. All of those things go up to finish the squat, not your chest and face. Um, I think MJ, you also may have another squat rack in here that's not facing the mirror, but maybe try to use, try to use something that's not facing the mirror. Yeah, Dale's in South Wales. Dale from Wales. I honestly, I have no idea about uh, geography of the UK at all. So who knows where that is? I'm assuming South. All right, let's get back to the show. We're going to talk more about uh, lumbar overextension. Okay. All right, cool. Um, so we saw some of this going on with um, Claire's squat. And then we're also going to see a guy named Rob, his deadlift. Um, Rob, sometimes Bob, uh, depending on what day you're talking to him. Johnny, I know they were in slow-mo, dude. They were the slow-mo squats. I saw, the, saw some of those videos again. Um, unless you were doing a 15 second tempo squat, but to, uh, to us on our end, they look like uh, slow-mo squats. So whenever you're, uh, going to the video setting on your iPhone, don't scroll over to slow-mo, make sure you're still on video. Um, but okay. All right. Uh, so just to get the basics for what we're thinking about for, uh, lumbar flexion versus extension. Um, one of the most common ones is thinking about like the cat cow position in yoga. Like you're arching your back up like a cat, like it's arched up. Um, like the apex of it is pointed up at the ceiling. Um, and then like the cow, I don't really see many cows with like dips in the middle of their back. Um, but the cow position, um, you're making a concave shape. The, the, the apex of, the, of like the bottom of that uh, turn is pointed down towards the, down towards the floor. Um, so the, the arched version is flexion. The, the concave version is extension, neutral, somewhere in between. Um, lumbar over extension is typically a problem in like kids, teens, or very thin men and women, people who don't have like a lot of muscle mass. Um, you're not going to see lumbar over extension on someone like MJDC. It's not going to be like a problem that causes other problems. Um, it can, it's, it's very rarely a phenomenon that you can notice on people who have uh, a lot of junk in the trunk. Um, they have like a lot of mass around their midsection. Um, people who really can't control eccentrics well, like kids or teens, a lot of times they'll fall into this arched extended position. Oh, you sent some triples in, Johnny? I'll have to look for those. I did not see those, but I will check. Um, but yeah, so, so you'll typically see them on kids and teens. That's really common. Um, thin women and thinner guys, you'll see that a lot. Um, this was a big problem for me when I was really small and didn't have like any sort of like muscle bellies around my erectors. I could extend the hell out of my lower back, right? But almost to a fault. Got to the point where I was focusing so much on that, it was causing other problems. Um, a lot of times people will think about uh, lumbar overextension as being like a problem with your pelvis. They'll call it like anterior pelvic tilt. Um, anterior pelvic tilt is like super hard to define. Most people will make those calls like visually. They'll think that their eyeballs are like an accurate enough measurement tool to tell you where your pelvis is in space and then if that's causing an actual problem. Um, so a lot of times what happens is it'll be like, oh, doctor, I have some lower back pain. They'll go to the PT. Um, and then the PT will be like, well, I mean, like, look at you, of course, you know, your pelvis is, is rotated, you know, X degrees too much. That's certainly the problem. Um, you have some anterior pelvic tilt. Um, 
it's it's a little bit hard to define, right? Because you have the muscle mass of their glutes, you have the muscle mass of their erectors causing all of these problems, like the pants they're wearing, clothes they're wearing. Like it's you don't really have comparative points across time if you're just looking at someone once. Um, lumbar overextension and subsequently anterior pelvic tilt, I think, are like overdiagnosed internet things that kind of you know cause some problems in like the the physical therapy meme world. Um, it does create some other problems. Like in Claire's squat, for example, um, we saw her, she was trying to stay too vertical on the descent um, because again, she was focusing in her brain almost entirely on lumbar extension. So rather than being able to drive the hips up with a rigid spine, she was thinking about lumbar extension and then driving the chest up. Kind of creates an awkward or clunky movement. Um, and then I'll show you guys a video example of it causing a hips too low version of the deadlift right now. We can see what's going on. Get back to there we'll find rob doing the deadlift okay and here we go all right rob in the basement um so it's kind of, it's unfortunate that that treadmill is right there because it almost like perfectly it would contrast the black shirt would contrast really well against the uh the white background that he has here. Um, but the first thing that we want to notice um, is that he's trying to stay really upright with his chest and with his gaze. Okay. He's doing a really good job of extending his back. If you can see this, we'll try and put it like this. All right. Pause it right here. And um, when we say look for wrinkles or make wrinkles in the back of your shirt, he's doing a great job of it. So literally the shirt is nice and smooth. And then as he gets set up, let's see it here. This one's the last one taking a few seconds. He arches this down, makes that nice extended shape. The wrinkles in the shirt happen. He's squeezing the chest up, um, but he's also shooting onto his heels and kind of sitting behind the bar. And a lot of that is also coming from the descent. Um, uh, Rob here, he was dealing with like some hip pain and I believe some lower back pain um, a few months ago. Um, and I think that experience with the pain is making him be like overly focused, hyper vigilant of what's going on with his lower back. Um, when you see deadlifters who are focusing on lumbar overextension, generally they'll report the deadlift being a oh, less pleasant and more uncomfortable experience than not. You know, um, if you give someone kind of an active task to focus on, they're going to focus most of their perception event in that area, right? So if all you're thinking about is your lower back and you're having some lower back issues, those, those two things may be more intertwined than you think. He's also doing a little bit of a shrug at the top. And we'll go back to the beginning so we can see rep one. Um, the hip height here on rep one is actually pretty good. Um, extensions, decent. The hips could be a little bit higher. The back could be a little bit more neutral. And then onto the descent, what we recommend for the descent is for the lifter to look down kind of somewhere right about here. They'll send their butt back and behind them and they'll drop the bar straight down. And what he's going to do is he's going to keep his face straight up towards the front, keep his pecs up, and then he's basically just going to squat the bar down. And what that is doing, it's reinforcing the focus on extension because he's not willing to let his back to go into flexion at any point during this whole thing. It's pushing the bar forward because it has to ramp off of his knees to get on the ground. Um, and it's making him drop his hips subsequently rep over rep. I think that was the best of the bunch. All right, we'll fast forward to back here. Let's see. Yeah, so it's almost ending up in this position where his weight, his center of balance is very much so on his heels right now. Um, he's loaded on the heels. Uh, his toes are almost coming off the ground. I've seen some of his squats and they kind of do a pretty similar thing. Um, and again, almost all of this is coming just from an over focus on uh, extension. You will see some people who can get what is perceived to be, or like to compare to the average guy would look like overextension, but if it's not causing problems for them, don't care about it. We'll go over that in a little bit, basically about when you should care about these things. Um, for a guy like Rob, it is causing other problems, right? It's causing some problems on the descent. He's unwilling to go into lumbar flexion. It's causing some point problems with his balance point. Um, it's causing some problems with the line of pull. Um, it's really just, it's, it's not a great situation overall. So that's certainly a time for you to correct it. And then we'll pop back to Claire's squat. Now that we've talked about this, so we can see what is going on. Almost there. Bam. Okay. Um, We'll see what's going on with her squat on the ascent. So staying super vertical, very reticent to lean over. And then what we're seeing when she's coming out of the bottom 
it's that lower back reorganizing rather than translating into like great upward movement of the bar. It almost looks like, you know, she's putting this into a tempo, like she's doing a tempo squat rather than uh, moving it as fast as she can. Um, one of the clues we know for that is like, if the bar has a really flat acceleration across the entire thing, like if it doesn't get any slower from the start of the rep to the end of the rep, and it doesn't get any slower from the first rep to the last rep, Generally, the person is thinking about something a little bit too much, um, or they're artificially imposing a tempo. Um, I'd argue uh, that Claire is probably um, focusing a little bit too much on uh, lumbar extension. Um, and then that's when we would say, hey, that's that's a little bit problematic. Let's call that overextension as opposed to normal or neutral. Um, starting strength, of course, uh, as they always do, has a really good video on it. I want to say it's identifying lumbar overextension with Mark Ripito. Um, and then they have another one uh, with Brie that I'm forgetting the name of. Okay. Um, now that we talked about that, we'll go back to the slides. Oh, no. Hold on. Aha. Dale's got a question for us. Let's see. He said, I have a hypothetical question, more of a what do you suppose sort of. Um, with powerlifting being such a niche sport, it is unlikely that the strongest, toughest, freakiest athletes participate. Um, yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's a very good point, Dale. It's, a, it's kind of like the genetic pool for things that aren't Olympic sports is always going to be smaller, you know. Um, like the things which almost everyone universally compete in tend to be things that have really low equipment demands that are very popular, like soccer or football, everybody else calls it, for example. You need kind of a big open area um, that doesn't have any mines in it or holes. Maybe it can have kind of holes. You need like two rough posts for goals and you need a ball. You know, uh, the participation rates for soccer in what we would consider, you know, developing countries, several countries, whatever you want to call them, astronomically high, you know. Um, the the more people you can get participating the more money that goes into it um uh the better those participants are going to be so any any sport that is at a high competitive level um that has a lot of nations with a lot of people being involved the quality that you're going to see is generally going to be quite high um so like in a, a powerlifting for example as of right now it's certainly it's it's international you know we have the ipf it's not an olympic sport um, weightlifting is an Olympic sport. So we do have a ton of freaky people who are doing Olympic weightlifting. Um, we don't have a ton of freaky people doing powerlifting. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why, like the five or six years ago, a qualifying total for uh, USAPL nationals is way different than it is now, right? Evolutionarily, people haven't changed that much. Programming wise, not terribly many things have changed from, you know, like th there hasn't been anything tremendously new that has been discovered. There's no one secret trick between like 2016 and now. Um, what do you suppose a LeBron level freak starting at age 12 could hit at his peak? Um, yeah, these are just hard questions to ask, man. I don't think they would be terribly different than the current numbers. Like you're, you're not going to see anything tremendously different, but you'll see like a different distribution. So rather than a very small amount of people being able to do what we consider tremendously strong now, you would just see more of those people, you know. Um, but like any sport with more money and more participants in it is going to be going to be significantly more popular. G Lock says, hi, Alex, that's me. How's it going, G Lock? Chase has the beatus, man. He's having a little beatus emergency, diabetes emergency. He had to, he had to skip this one. Um, this is a good. This is a good show for uh, for G Lock. Um, he has a little bit of knee valgus and a big focus on lumbar extension. Um, so certainly go back and watch these things. But I probably I've already told you them, so it doesn't really matter. Um, so the big thing here. Oh, Jay Resso. How's it going, dude? Send some videos in, man. We're almost clearing out the queue. I only have a few more. I guess Johnny G sent in some more. Uh, but we've been productive on these past two shows. Um, but yeah, we're going to talk about when to correct these things and then what questions are appropriate to ask when you're attempting to correct them. Um, and again, this is in reference to like a valgus knee position or the knee cave pattern um, and then lumbar overextension. The first thing is, is it causing pain, right? If it is, here we go. Returning to training despite my back problems. My girlfriend is doing SS2. Oh, that's awesome, man. Um, yeah, if you can be in a household that trains with both people and both people can be like cheery about it, like they're in collaborating and invested in the project, I've noticed tremendous success with that. Yeah, that's always like a, that's just kind of a little slam dunk. Um, cause like you can both kind of be accountability tools for each other as long as you're on the same page. That's great. How, so you said the back pain is, uh, hopefully doing better. 
I think that's the implication here, but let me know. Um, but back to the prior point, uh, is it causing pain? Um, so like in Jay Russo's, uh, Jay Russo's situation, for example, he's having pain doing squats past a certain depth. Let's just say it's that for specific. Um, the back position that accompanies that depth in the squat, if it's causing him pain, you can probably pull it out and find a workaround for now. Um, so if someone's knees are shooting in and whenever they're shooting in, um, it's causing them pain or unnecessary difficulty in the movement, consider fixing it. Now you can fix it by regulating load. So let's say for example, anytime you pull over 345, your knees basically touch each other when they're coming off of the floor, right? You, some people can have valgus knees on the deadlift. Anytime you pull over 345, that happens. Consider just pulling 335, but just a lot, and then dealing with that, basically kind of raising your upper tolerance for the problem later on. Um, a lot of these issues that are causing pain can be dealt with through load management. Um, if you think the technique is efficient and the technique isn't the sole cause of the pain, sometimes it is just the load. Um, especially if it's kind of like an axial fatigue issue where your back just feels crushed from carrying heavy weights all the time. Um, with the issue of valgus knees, not terribly many people I don't think um, have a lot of pain from that. I did get a question about that from uh, one of my Saudi Arabian clients. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but if that is causing the pain, it is certainly something that you'll attempt to correct. Um, now you will need to think about uh, the movement pattern that you're doing. Will it allow for future progress? Um, is it allowing progress now? And then will it also allow for progress three months from now, a year from now, things like that. Um, so if let's, the Olympic lifts are a really good example for this. If you just start doing the Olympic lifts and then you took your clean from zero to 50 kilos, you're like, wow, this is great. My technique is allowing for progress and it's not painful very certainly your technique is trash and it's not going to allow for future progress for future gains whenever you're going from 100 to 125. Um, so when you're attempting a technique intervention, you need to think about that future progress. So like if you have like a pretty decent squat, pretty decent deadlift, and you think your technique is keeping you over midfoot and then satisfying the conditions, like you're locking it out, um, you're not falling, you're not causing any pain, your technique will probably allow for future gain. Um, but if you think it's not going to, so like, let's say, for example, the knees are coming in so much that you're losing your balance point, then certainly intervene. Or like your knees are coming in too much that you can't drive your hips up, certainly intervene. Um, and then the third one, this is the one I think with the most depth is, is it going to be efficient? Um, now efficient here could mean a few things. You could be talking about like preference for the individual lifter. Like, let's say they may really like high bar squats, right? But you think that they can squat more low bar. Um, that preference is going to impact efficiency because it's going to impact buy-in, it's going to impact willingness and enjoyment, all those things. Um, is it going to impact fatigue? So like, let's say for example, like the lifter can do a ton of deadlifting and not really feel much fatigue. Right. But then they, for some reason, really want to hammer home um, uh, a bunch of squats or something like that. They want to hammer home a bunch of low bar squats um, and it's interfering with the fatigue for the deadlift or vice versa. Um, then the techniques that they're using in both of those lifts could cause a problem. You know, um, so like when you're talking about technique, you have to think about the fatigue costs that those techniques will have which is like high bar versus low bar, sumo versus conventional, um, a really arched bench versus a flat bench. Um, and then the starting strength camp, we're very firm believers in the mechanics impacting the lift. Um, so like uh, some of the things that we saw earlier, like Rob and Claire and MJ, um, all of them were violating some principles that we hold dearly at starting strength that we consider mechanically efficient. And then their lifts showed those results. Right. Um, so it's like not great bar speeds. It looked uncomfortable. The lifts weren't, weren't really being completed too well. Um, these kind of are our arguments for mechanical efficiency. Um, if we can kind of analyze them with our moment model, take a step back, figure out what's going on, use our coaching models, um, we tend to have a better problem. Uh, Johnny G he said, since I tend to pull my hamstrings a lot um, or during the deadlift, should I not do them but do rack pulls? Um, Johnny G, your hips are too high when you deadlift. We've seen this many a time. You tend to let the bar drift out in front of you, and you tend to kind of snap the bar off the floor. All of those things aren't great for your hamstrings. Um, you can certainly get over them, but the fatigue cost is going to be really high. Um, so what I would recommend is probably figuring out the form, you know, sending the videos more of your deadlift than your squat like you're doing now. Um, Rack pulls are probably a good assistance for you, but it's not a solution. And I would also just say load management. You know, whenever we do see deadlifts from you, Johnny G, they're like grinders. They're they're not smooth reps for the most part. They're like, okay, he may be able to get this for a single, and then you sometimes grind out a double, things like that. 
Um, Jay Resso. He said, I found massages to be very useful. I'm doing full ROM squats again, thanks to them. Five pounds each workout. Start again with just the bar, slow but steady. In the past week, I couldn't even do bodyweight squats. Um, he has not introduced deadlift yet, just pull-ups, but I'm planning to do block pulls. That's great to hear, man. Yeah, the the the, the back chronicle for Jay Russo has been very long thought. Um, what I would say about the pull-ups is that... Um, depending on what lower back position you have for them, that can be irritating for some people. So like if you get really swingy with them, just like the rapid cycling of extension to flexion um, and kind of like that in that, in that tension. Um, thanks, Johnny G. Um, but yeah, so chin-ups and pull-ups can sometimes be irritating for people's lower backs if they're already cranky. Um, so in those situations, I always go to like a machine row, a lat pull down, something where it's like, it's not really dynamic, um, but introducing that dynamism may be really helpful for you, Jay Rosso. So. Um, I would say even if you just start with like really, really light things. I know you said you started with the bar um, for squats. I don't think starting with like 65, 75 pounds is unreasonable for your deadlift at all. You know, you got to start from square one. Um, which point did we leave off of? Yeah, mechanical efficiency. Um, so if it's going to be mechanically efficient, uh, as we argue in the starting strength textbooks, it tends to be comfortable for the lifter, right? Um, it can be a little bit like art or magic of coaching thing if you get everybody together and then they're already invested in it. Um, but like if you just take a random person off the street and you tell them to squat, it's probably going to be uncomfortable and not to depth and probably a little bit forward on their toes. Their chest is going to be too vertical. We've solved all of those things. We have a really tight model for coaching it. We have the mechanics to back it up. Um, so when you're considering to correct a movement pattern, you need to consult efficiency almost first before fatigue and preference. Um, so like, let's say for example, Rob's deadlifts that we saw earlier, um, that could be because of those poor mechanics could have a much higher fatigue cost and it could make him not like the deadlift because it's such a bad experience for him. Um, so if we can fix these things, make it feel easier, make it feel more solid, we can oftentimes change that lifter's preference, change their experience with the lift, um, and then also change the relative fatigue cost. Um, let's see, I think we have, I have one more video I want to say here. Yeah, we got one from Jeremy B. Jeremy G, excuse me, not Jeremy B. Pull this up here. All right, Jeremy's pressing and he's staring directly into the camera. This is my favorite view for pressing. It's very intimate. And we have some reds on the bar. This is moving really fast for a red, man. If these are traditionally weighted plates, that's pretty cool. Um, so the first thing that we can see here is that he's not at all shrugging at the top. So he stops here. And then a big component of the starting strength press um, is that we clear the shoulder at the top. So it's like, I'm not just going here. I'm going all the way up to uh, all the way up. I'm shrugging my shoulder up with the bar. And um, we want to move the bar the extra inch and a half, two inches. Um, people who press inside of a rack, I'll always tell them, hey, try and hit the top of the rack with the bar. You know, like I don't want you to jump onto your toes, but shrug as hard as you can into it. Um, this tends to, this helps work the traps out and tends to help it be more comfortable for a lot of people's shoulders. He's doing a good job of bracing. You guys can't hear that, but I can. I think the hip movement needs to be more. Um, he is doing a little bit of a strict press, but he off, out of the bottom, but he is still allowing for that layback. Um, so I think using our uh, Olympic press model where the hips shoot forward is a means to bounce out of the bottom. He could add another, you know, uh, seven, eight kilos to this pretty easily. Um, I would also widen up the stance during this whole process. Big breath in the bottom, throw the hips forward. Um, but these are like really smooth. It looked like he could have done this for, you know, significantly more reps than he did. Um, so if Jeremy's doing this and he's just adding two and a half kilos, two kilos at a time, that's, that's fine by me. I think the shrug would certainly be helpful for you, buddy. Um, Johnny G here, he said, never used a belt would help with my numbers. Um, maybe, maybe not. It's, it's not magic for everybody. Um, it's a good tool to know how to use for a, like a lengthy lifting career, you know? Um, I would say most people end up using them. And I don't think it's just a, it's just kind of like a cultural artifact, you know, um, like I think it helps people move bigger weights over time. You know, um, someone could be a weenie and be like, well, do you have a study for that? And it's like, no, but you know, don't be a weenie. Um, yeah. Consider using it. I wouldn't start just like ripping into your working sets at hundred percent PR weight with a belt. If you never used it before, um, 
any of your lighter work, consider that your time to learn how to use the belt. You know, so like, let's say if you're doing like heavy squat day, Monday, light squats, Wednesday, moderate squats, Friday, um, you can try the belt on those light squat days. And then eventually when you're more confident with it, move it to the moderate day as well. And then once you're more and more confident with it, try it on the heavy squats. Um, you could even put it on for all of your warm up sets. And then when you get to your working set, if you feel comfortable with it, leave it on. If you don't take it off, you know, um, there's, there's no hard, fast rules for it. Um, but the belts typically are helpful for most people. I'm going to go through this one more time. Just make sure I didn't miss anything here. Graham Frazier. Um, I'm in an interesting uh, situation right now. I don't really train uh, the barbell lifts too much. Um, I'm focusing on sport and I have a little bit of a medical thing going on right now. Um, I train uh, judo between three to four times a week, um, wrestle maybe once a week, uh, do BJJ one or two times a week. Um, and then I typically am just like benching and deadlifting now. I haven't squatted in a hot minute. Um, it's causing some problems with my cervical discs. Um, bench right now is in the mid twos, um, deadlift. Most working sets are in the high threes. The harder working sets are in the fours. Um, Johnny G he said, I formed ab squatting. So a belt would counter the ab development. Absolutely not. No. Mm -mm. Um, the belt is just a thing like a knee sleeve or a squat shoe. They're just kind of a thing to help. Um, it's not going to prohibit, uh, hinder or advance ab development in any way. Um, but yeah, lifetime PRs for me, Grant, I think lifetime squat PR was 430. Lifetime deadlift PR was 530. Lifetime press was 205 or 210, I think. Um, lifetime bench 265, if I remember those correctly. It's been quite some time. All right, we've watched enough of Jeremy pressing. Um, let's see. Oh, no, we actually watched that one last week. All right, cool. We'll go back to. Hmm, where'd that go? Everybody bear with me through the tech support. Aha, here we go. Um, yeah, any questions you guys have, please feel free to call them out. Um, I'll just go through the things I wanted to cover, just make sure we did all of them. Um, we talked about the knee cave, the valgus knee position. We talked about lumbar extension, and we talked about one correct movement. That's a little bit more of a nuanced subject. It'll be good to have Chase here for that. Um, Chase is having aggressive diabetes. He's not here. We went over some form checks. Um, oh yeah, guests for upcoming ones. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're working on, we're working on getting some more people for the cool guy series. And if you guys have anyone particular in mind, please let us know. Um, anything I feel like I should cover probably more. Hmm. Let's go through this. Creating problems. If so, what? Yeah, I would say the, the creating other problems thing, this is kind of where the eye comes in. Um, how long have you been an SS coach? Uh, Graham, I got my certification uh, credential on January 2nd of 2020. Um, Chase got his on January 1st. Yes, 2020. And it is, it will forever be irritating that I'm one day behind. But hey, what are you going to do? Um, yeah, so the creating other problems thing, if so, what? Um, lumbar overextension uh, or the focus on the lower back, even if it's not in an overly extended position, can cause a lot of problems. Um, generally, for people who are hypervigilant of every sensation that runs through their lower, lower, lower back, um, giving them another task to focus on can be really helpful. Like focus on how the bar feels in your hands, focus on squeezing your chest up, focus about how your feet feel on the floor. Um, it can distract them away from their lower back things tend to smooth out a little bit. Um, if you have a lifter who has had like a, a series of, you know, problems with their lower back and you tell them to like only think about your lower back and nothing else, um, I would wager that like propensity for pain events is probably going to be a little bit higher. Um, same thing with movement. You know, a lot of coaching is figuring out uh, where to get someone to focus. You know, um, when you're using a cue, you are giving them that focus point for them. Um, you know, so that's that's kind of the triage. It's it's figuring out is this knee valgus actually causing an issue? Chances are probably not. Is this lumbar overextension causing an issue? Chances are it may well be. You know, um, questions. Johnny G. He says, "Will dumbbell work interfere with my bench progress?" Um, no, mm -mm. no. Uh, that's a programming thing. Um, we have some decent programming episodes. You probably have seen those, Johnny. Um, but go through about how to add accessory work. Um, generally, what you're looking for is the most you can tolerate. That does not interfere with your primary lifts. If your primary lifts are still moving along at the pace you want them to, um, 
So like, let's say, for example, you know, you're benching two times a week, Monday, Friday, you're pressing in the middle on Wednesday. And then on after Friday's benching, you come in and you add two or three sets of dumbbell benching. That's not the end of the world. It's not really going to hinder anything. Um, nor if you figure out how to dose it so that you could do some on Wednesday. Like if you do six sets on Wednesday, it'll probably interfere with Friday's bench for sure. Um, if you add in three sets on Wednesday, it probably won't interfere with Fridays and then you're good for there. You know, um, I would say consider a coach, Johnny G consider a coach. If you're having programming questions like that and you, you haven't been able to figure out where to place accessories, some more direct guidance may be helpful for you. Um, Graham, what's the best shoes that you've found? Um, I have the, like the Adidas Tokyo power lifts. Um, there's like a little Japanese guy on the back with like, uh, with a barbell and some weightlifting clothes. It's really cute. Um, has a Japanese flag on it. I really like those. Like the canvas material is nice. The heel height is nice. Lace structure. It's all really solid. Um, for people who have really short, um, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say, I don't want to bring up the term ankle mobility here at all. If someone wants a higher heel, I think Reebok Legacy is a really, really good one. I really like the Legacy. Um, that has a very aggressive heel. My recommendation used to be the Romelio here. Um, just sent you a video. Uh, Jay Russo, where'd you send it to? Email? You sent it to support at strength.club. Hmm. To my mail. Oh, there it is. Cool. All right, let me download this. This better not be sketchy, Jay Russo. We'll check. Hopefully we're not gonna see anything too lewd on the internet. That would be bad. Bam, okay. We're gonna reform that this. Jay Russo, I am assuming this is your girlfriend who is doing starting strength as well. And you coached her. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, first thing I would say um, is to get a good rack position, the bar can't be sitting on top of her hair. Have her put her hair to the side or just in a ponytail. Have the bar be seated in the correct position, and then she'll be able to flip the hair back if she needs to, or it can just hang down and off the side. Um, coaching women, you never just want to have the bar mated into the hair because it's like the knurling can be a problem. If the bar slips, it's going to be a problem. You don't really want to have to deal with that too much. Uh, move the hair first thing for sure. Um, get her some lifting shoes if possible. These are some flats. These look like Converse or Vans. Um, she's a little bit high a depth, Jay. So we'll try and pause this. Whoop. That's about as deep as she gets. Um, so if she can get about another three inches deeper, like if her you know hip crease can be a little bit lower here, a little bit below the knee, that would be a really good spot. Um, yeah, she. I think she's again. It's very possible she's focused too much on back extension. She's really trying to keep a rigid back here. Um, I would use cues like relax into the bottom, sink into the bottom, keep going down. A lot of this is going to be interset instruction, like squatting for longer than you think you need to. Um, I don't think there's anything preventing her from getting to depth right now. Okay. Um, she's a little bit too vertical, you know, uh, especially for the high bar position. Um, or I think that's being accentuated by the high bar position. Um, but she could get deeper if she wants to here. Uh, I would say uh, to migrate down to the low bar position, uh, make sure you watch uh, Phil Megger's video on that. Um, I want to say it's nailing the bar position in the squat. It, he has a lifter there. He, you know, palpates. Um, oh, it's here we go. He said it's very hard for her uh, to have the confidence to go deep. Stop adding weight. Do lighter work. Okay. Um, so like, let's say this is her Monday squat on Wednesday, do lighter squats, maybe go to like four sets of six Add a pause at the bottom, take, you know, 15 pounds off the bar, 20 pounds off the bar, get her confident in that bottom position. And she'll realize she can do it with normal squats too. Um, don't prohibit future progress by not squatting to depth because she is having a little bit of an issue with it now with confidence. Um, so you can address that by managing weight on the bar. Um, and you have some chains on here too. These are pretty sick, man. I think this is like a homemade concrete. These are some concrete plates. And I just realized there's some chains hanging off the right side. That's awesome, man. Um, yeah, so for a lot of people, they don't have a tremendous amount of confidence going down to the bottom with that high bar position. Um, it may just not feel very secure for her. Uh, so try the low bar, see if it feels comfortable and secure, um, and then work on getting her to lean over more, work on getting her with lighter work to go deeper. Um, if, you're, if, you, if you know what you're doing, you can get that done in one session. It may not need multiple weeks of light work. Um, 
I would not stop adding weight to the bar. <laughs> he said, yeah, the chain weighs two and a half pounds. <laughs> yeah, that's creative, man. That's good. Um, I would not stop adding weight to the bar on the top end, like still have her do a few top triples just to kind of keep that going, keep progress going for her mentally. Um, but I would make sure all of her uh, warm up sets, all of her light work, all of that is done a little bit deeper, significantly deeper. Um, that way she can kind of use those comparison points and then get comfortable to do it um, with her working sets. Um, you know, if you do have that type of relationship with her where she's like, okay, with stopping the progress and you're going to say, Hey, you're going to fix this now. And we're not going to go up until it's fixed. That's probably fine too. And um, that's kind of a personal call, but these are, these are decent. Fix the bar position, get her to lean over, get her to depth. That's some of the comments here. Yeah. Graham said he has the power perfect three. Um, Romelios used to just be super cool. I think they're just a little bit too expensive now for what you're getting. I think there are like better shoes that have, you know, uh, I think the, uh, honestly, the shoes don't matter tremendously much. If you have a pair of lifting shoes, you're fine. It's not the end of the world really in any direction. Um, the difference I would say is just like, you can have something with a really short heel or a taller heel, really only think about heel height. The rest of the quality is not going to be super uh it's not going to be a big swaying factor the thing that's going to hold you back from 500 pound deadlift is not going to be your lifting shoes you know um johnny g he says can't find a coach here in ca how many clients do i have in california i have three clients in california man i have one in ventura uh one in fort Oren, one in something that's below of Ventura. Oh man, I'm curious about that now. Let's look that up. All right, everybody bear with me here. I got to figure out where this guy lives. Mission Viejo, wherever the hell that is. If anyone knows where that is, please let me know. Um, but yeah, uh, online coaching, it's, it's more than enough to handle most of those things. Most of those things. Captain Awesome, I am just about to end the stream, dude. You gotta you gotta do the little bell thing for the notifications. I've been here for 56 minutes, dog. Yeah, Jay Russo. Keep us posted, man. It may seem a little bit silly to send in videos for like a 65 pound squat or 85 pound deadlift like you're, you, you could be doing now, but send them in. I'm not kidding. It's probably pretty helpful. Um, I would make sure that your users you're still aggressively loading the bench. Um, and then uh, use the press as a tool to start tolerating axial loading more, you know? Um, so like if you're, if, if you are uh, very slowly loading the press, you know, consider being a little more aggressive with that. You can probably tolerate more. I did, but I don't hang out at home checking YouTube. I don't know, man, get the, get the app, do the app stuff. I try to have as little apps as possible on my phone. So I, I sympathize. I'm all subbed up and everything. Well, thanks Captain Awesome. Oh, I pinned that somehow. I don't know how I pinned that, but it's pinned now. I don't know what that means. All right, Captain Awesome. I'm here for, let's say, two, two-ish more minutes. Here we go. Graham said he got a, I a got Byron from London. He's good. What's your best tip for low bar? I'm going to be honest with you, Graham. Sometimes I don't understand what people from the UK are saying, and this is one of those situations. I don't know what this first part of this sentence means. A got Byron from London. He's good. What's your best tip for low bar? What is my best tip for low bar? I understood that second part of the question. Um, yeah, absolutely, Jerusalem. Yeah, keep sending videos in of the lady friend. Glad that you got her lifting. Um, best tip for low bar, I would say, um, is be willing to lean over. You know, um, a lot of people are super concerned about like the chest fall pattern or doing a good morning, um, where if you're satisfying the criteria, if you are getting down below depth, if you were staying at your midfoot and you were standing up to lockout, you're fine. Um, don't worry. Oh, is his name got Bra Byron? That sounds like a very that sounds like a very British starting strength coach named Lord Byron. Yeah, I haven't met the guy. I, I know we have Carl Ragavan, Ragavan out there. Uh, I met him once. He's a, he's a nice little meatball. I don't know who this Byron gentleman is. Um, but yeah, be willing to lean over. Don't worry too much about your torso angle. It, 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 what needs to happen will happen on its own. That's what I would say for sure. 
Um, he's English. I would assume he's English. Yeah, good old Barbell Byron. I feel like I've never seen anyone in the United States named Byron at all. It seems like a comical fake name that we would use to make fun of English people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's good to know that they are real and they do exist out there. Um, anything else to cover, boys? Am Scottish. Do you mean and, or are you saying that you're Scottish? I think I think Graham means that he is Scottish, and then Byron is English. So you guys presumably hate each other. That's what I would assume. You know who should, we should have on the the cool guy guest list? We should get somebody from the IRA. That's probably what it should be. We should get a we should get someone from the Irish Republican Army. Um, Captain Awesome said there's probably like one Byron in the U.S. and public schools are a nightmare for him. I would hope so. His parents deserve to realize that was a mistake. Yeah, Graham, if you have any IRA contacts, let us know. We'll get them on the show. Nice and anonymous. Um, but all right, well, I guess we'll go through the socials again. Um, you can follow Chase at Chase Lindley. Hopefully he's posting some cool stuff in his backup account at Chase underscore Lindley. Um, I do online coaching. All that's going to be at acostrength.com. And if you want to get videos on the show, email them to support at strength.club. Um, I believe Johnny G sent some of those in. We'll get those on for next week. Um, send in some deadlift videos, send in your girlfriends, send in your mother, whatever you got going on. Um, we'll watch it and then hopefully be able to help out. Um, but thank you guys so much for watching. Bye.